Thank you very much. Uh, it's really my pleasure to present this work at, uh, at this forum. Um, this is uh, really the first piece of uh, funded work that I have done uh, specifically around a mission uh, at Mars and uh, also one of my favorite topics, in situ resource utilization, which I think first captivated my interest in, uh, in space technology in the first place. So I'm very pleased to, uh, to share the results of this project with you. Um, so this resulted from a, uh, a conference where I met one of the co-founders of this small company uh, up in Berkeley called Opus 12. We were actually at a Caltech event about three years ago uh, talking about how to make um, propellant from in situ resources on Mars. And uh, I told her a little bit about my company, a small uh, modeling and sort of a pseudo engineering uh, firm. And she got really excited about the work that I have been doing in artificial photosynthesis, which is using sunlight to split apart molecules such as water, but also things like CO2 in order to make uh, fuel plus oxygen. We were focused on hydrogen oxygen at the time, but then later uh, branched out to look at uh, carbon-based fuels. And so I just essentially pivoted that work that had been part of my day job and applied it to this uh, research project with uh, her company. Um, so that was a NASA SBIR phase two that I got some subcontract funding for. It was, um, so the mission, uh, the goal of the project was to develop a preliminary uh, design for a device that would uh, sit on the surface of Mars um, and produce both um, methane oxygen fuel to refuel a, uh, a lander, uh, basically a Mars ascent vehicle, if people are familiar with that concept, uh, and also make some kind of useful plastic out of the uh, in situ uh, resources there. Uh, I'll, I'll get into a little bit about the assumptions. We didn't have to design a lander to, to get there or, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, power plant that would supply the, uh, the electricity needed to do this. These were sort of assumed we had to say what our maximum energy use was and obviously our, our mass of the payload was very important. Um, we were also uh, given pure hydrogen, I mean, pure water and CO2 is kind of uh, inputs, uh, input assumptions for this uh, design um, project. Uh, it, the project itself, at least my uh, portion, lasted 18 months starting in uh, uh, 2017, ending in end of 2018. And um, so as I said, I have a background in electrochemical modeling. Uh, and also life cycle analysis, which is how I got into this um, artificial photosynthesis work. Um, I also uh, participated uh, in this Keck workshop a couple years ago, which was trying to, from a high level, design an optimal system for making propellant on Mars. Um, okay, and uh, I think I mentioned this, I guess just a couple of other design parameters. The goal of the project was to produce at least 95% purity methane from the mixture of gases that comes off of the system, as well as this uh, uh, polyethylene or possibly a different useful plastic from, from the gases. We did wind up going with polyethylene. Um, so just to show you that parts of this actually exist, uh, this is the electrochemical cell that Opus 12 has been spending several years developing. So that gives you an idea of its size. Uh, electrochemical cells are basically high pressure cells that um, pump a lot of electricity into the cell and they have flowing gases and then you've got chemical reactions happening on interfacial surfaces and you've got pro uh, products, either gases or liquid, coming off. Um, this is a photograph of the team from uh, sometime last year developing uh, or delivering an integrated package to a client. I don't know who the client is. Obviously this is an earth-based application, not something for space, but um, one of the, uh, the researchers here um, Tasha Cave, who was my contact, uh, was also interested in space-based activities and s sort of saw it a, a side application for their technology that. So even though they're mostly building things for Earth, uh, they sort of have an interest in, in, in space applications as well. Um, so for those of you unfamiliar with electrochemistry, when you pump uh, electricity into a, uh, a reactor vessel, you typically get more than one uh, chemical product out. There are certain reactions depending on the conditions and especially the catalyst where you will essentially just get one thing out. So for instance, if all you have is water in there, you pretty much get just hydrogen on the cathode side and, and oxygen on the anode. 
Uh, there are also uh, conditions where you're reducing carbon dioxide and you basically get just carbon monoxide. But carbon uh, monoxide is not a really great rocket fuel and it also has some other, uh, shall we say, negative uh, Im impacts if it's uh, breathed in close proximity. So uh, that wasn't really what we were going after. And for, uh, um, for making uh, methane or other sort of more uh, useful hydrocarbons, you wind up with this mixture. So this gives you an example, and this is not quantitative, but it's sort of like an approximation of what things uh, might look like um, for an for a, uh, electrochemical cell. So we've got, I'll just read this because it's a little small. We've got a mixture of methane, ethylene, hydrogen is also produced, carbon monoxide, as I mentioned, and then ethanol, et cetera. There's a bunch of different things in here, including formic acid and some other gases, maybe some propylene, but also in very small amounts. But these were additional contaminants that we also had to deal with and figure out how to get rid of. So what this winds up being is a chemical separations pro problem rather than just a, uh, uh, a, a sort of a straightforward, uh, okay, make the gas and then do something with it. But really, the, the separation winds up being one of the biggest design constraints in this problem. And so depending, as I said, on the catalyst and other sort of special, almost artsy uh, um, conditions that the, the, the team has been um, playing with, they can enhance the concentration of a certain desired product, like methane in this case, at the expense of others, but they can never get it 100 percent. And so I think they told me anecdotally that they were able to get well in excess of 50 percent methane by, by energy in this, um, in this cell and sort of ideally tuned up, and uh, around 50 percent ethylene if you switch the conditions to a different way, um, but uh, not like 95 percent like what we were looking for. So we had to deal with that mixture. <clears throat> there we go. So. Um, I think I'll just stand on this side so I can see what I'm pointing to. So this is, this is a uh, block diagram showing all the parts of the complete system with the part that we were designing highlighted in this red box. So as I said, we are not responsible for designing the whole thing. Really, uh, we are given pure CO2 and deionized water as assumed inputs. Uh, this is because this would be imagined as integrated in a uh, in situ chemical um, uh, device package that would be landed that would be m making these gases for other reasons. So you would need purified water for providing, um, you know, a source of, uh, of oxygen possibly for astronauts to breathe, for, uh, for drinking, of course, maybe for doing some other chemical processes where you need pure water. So this is being recovered from raw regolith with a bunch of steps here, uh, reacting the soil, cleaning up the impurities that come off, and eventually delivering that. And then similarly with CO2, obviously most of you know, I hope all of you know, that Mars atmosphere is 95% uh, CO2, but there's dust and there's other gases that would still have to be removed. So that was not my problem. I was just given the pure CO2. Um, we created the products that we wanted here and separated out the stuff that we didn't. And then what sort of happened outside was sort of the final, final cleanup. In other words, uh, drying it and uh, uh, eventually liquefying it, if you're pr making propellant, uh, was not part of our, our design scope either. But you'll see that there was a little bit of blurring of lines. We actually did some of these external separation steps within des the design because we kind of had to. So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so uh, after about, um, I would say, six or eight months worth of uh, sort of noodling around, we, we settled on what the physical design layout would look like. Um, we wanted to make this as small as possible, and eventually we came up with a uh, total mass uh, inventory as well that I'll show you. But basically, this looks like a, uh, a cube that is about um, two thirds of a meter uh, on on either side, and uh, so it's actually a cube that's about two thirds of a meter uh, on all three sides, right? Rough, roughly speaking, in the center here is this device stack. Okay, which has several of these components here that sort of sit right on top of each other with the electrochemical cell at the bottom and the, mem the final membrane separation uh, on the top. And so you can think of the gases as sort of working their way through these various stages. And then all this stuff around it are these folded radiator panels, which wound up being the most massive um, and important part of the whole system. Because the problem is that you're pumping a whole bunch of electricity into this little tiny device. It gets very hot. It's not 100% energy conversion efficient, of course. They assumed optimistically that 70% of the electrons that went into it would actually work their way into chemical bonds, but that still uh, 
that still left us with 30% as waste heat. And this wound up being more than 10 kilowatts of, uh, of, of, of heat energy that we had to get rid of. And so uh, in order to be able to affect that, we had to radiatively cool it to the Martian atmosphere. Now, um, or to the, to the Martian environment, I should say. Um, Mars does have a very thin atmosphere, and so there is some possibility of convective cooling when the wind is blowing, but it's usually very weak, and we didn't want to rely on it for getting rid of the, the waste heat. So uh, in case of a still day, it still had to be able to work. So that's what we designed around, and any convective cooling would be sort of bonus on, on top of that. So uh, when this is deployed, these four folded panels kind of spread out like this. They're each about five and a half meters long, so it's quite large considering the overall size of the device. Kind of looks like a giant uh, star as it's spread out on the surface. And the fourfold symmetry was partly so that you would have uh, the maximum area to be able to uh, radiate in different directions and not have a lot of uh, re-radiation onto other surfaces and to avoid um, sunlight as much as possible. But again, for simplicity, this was not steerable. And so there is going to be some incoming solar radiation that will heat uh, part of the surface as well. But fortunately, we're radiating away a lot more than we're absorbing from heat. And they would be designed to sort of um, minimize the absorption in the visible light spectrum anyway and sort of um, radiate maximally in the, in the mid-IR uh, for, for what you would expect for something at this temperature, roughly 40 degrees C. So this is what it looks like deployed. Um, we were not as a high technical uh, competence to be able to sort of think about exactly how you would avoid rocks and things like that. We assumed that there would be cameras that might be able to direct us away from a boulder that's in its line of path, but uh, there weren't any super smart robotics that would steer things around. So hopefully you would deploy and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be blocked by something. So now back to kind of the chemistry and uh, sort of systems engineering of it. So essentially, um, this consists of three, three stages. Um, I mean, the heart of it, of course, is the electrochemical cell that does the initial chemical conversion where most of the energy is, is being generated uh, and pumped in. And then we have, after that, its separations. And uh, after thinking about this um, and talking about it with, with many people, we realized that uh, two of the gases that are kind of difficult to separate, carbon monoxide and um, carbon dioxide, could be uh, solved rather nicely by just converting that CO into CO2. Uh, this is a fairly simple reaction that doesn't require very much energy. It's called water gas shift. Um, and it essentially takes all of the CO that is produced and uh, oxidizes it to CO2. And then you just have a much cleaner separation problem where you've got CO2, which uh, for, for several reasons has unique chemical properties that you can, you can cleanly separate it from everything else. The hydrogen that's there is separated along with it, and what you're left off, what you are left off with, are the uh, methane and ethylene gases, uh, uh, pretty much in pure form. The other things like ethanol are also pretty easy to get get rid of because they uh, they condense at a much uh, lower um, temperature. So uh, then that became a, a design challenge of making a compact water gas shift system. And then the final separation with some, a couple of different membrane stages to get rid of the hydrogen plus CO2 that's produced and the, uh, and the methane and, and, uh, and ethylene. Now, before I go on, I will just say, wait, I thought we were supposed to make pure C, uh, CH4, methane. Why are you kind of treating these both together? And it turns out that um, methane and ethylene are actually pretty similar chemically. Uh, ethylene does have two carbons, and so it is a little heavier. But it is extremely difficult to separate unless you have a very high performance uh, gas phase distillation system, which is unfortunately very mass and energy intensive. And so we looked through the chemical literature and we talked to some experts in, in membrane separations and we really couldn't solve this problem. There are some promising uh, exploratory designs out there that use some sort of exotic approaches to be able to separate these two gases better, but we decided that with the state of the art, it was not really feasible to be able to do this. And so rather than um, declare failure and go home, we thought, well, hold on, what kind of a propellant is ethylene as compared to methane, and discovered that actually it is very similar in its uh, combustion properties to um, methane and could, with some hopefully uh, modest modifications to the rocket uh, engine, uh, be burned together with an almost identical specific impulse and, uh, you know, sort of relatively minor changes to the total mass budget. I mean, obviously you can't just 
put one in for the other, but uh, it is one path that one could go, is just accept the mixture as the product, and if it works well for other reasons, that could be one way to go. But uh, I have a surprise in store. When we go on to make the polyethylene, which needs monoethylene, ethylene we're making, as an input gas, it turns out that the methane that is along for the ride is completely inert in that reaction. And so by virtue of taking that ethylene and polymerizing it, you wind up purifying the methane and you get 95% uh, pure methane out of the other end. So I'll show you that at the end, uh, that second stage. But if you're only doing this and you're not doing the plastics, you have to deal with the mixture. So the water gas, sh gas uh, shift system is basically a two-stage um, reactor where you, um, you, you bump up the temperature and the pressure a little bit, and uh, you have an initial conversion of that, of that CO to, uh, uh, to CO2, but it doesn't go all the way. Uh, in, order to, in order to get the last few percent of CO to convert, you have to lower the temperature, and it's because of the way the, um, the efficiencies change as you've got more of the, uh, the CO2 in the reactor and less of the, uh, the CO around. And so we wind up dropping the temperature by passing the mixture through a heat exchanger and then running it through a so-called low temperature reactor at about 200 degrees in order to get the very uh, last of the, of the carbon monoxide to convert. So it winds up being a little bit bulky, but in the scheme of things, it's really not that big. It takes up a roughly 20 by 20 centimeter footprint, which is part of this design uh, parameters of the stack. And it consumes just about a kilowatt of extra energy. And so it seemed like a modest amount compared to the roughly 30 kilowatts that we're pushing in in the, in the first place. Uh, then the other thing that we had to do, I'm not going to show the membrane separation, but getting rid of the water so that you have a dry gas stream at the end is also very important. And so the simplest design uh, concept there was just to put it through a uh, reusable desiccant. So essentially, this is a porous membrane that's uh, very hygroscopic. It loves to absorb and hold on to moisture, but it can be um, teased out of uh, uh, holding on to that moisture by raising it to roughly 25 or 30 degrees, so it's a pretty modest temperature. So essentially, you pump these wet gases through here, um, the moisture is collected, and then roughly once an hour, you have like a five-minute purge where you heat, the, heat this through some uh, metal ceramic heaters on the top and bottom, and it causes all the water to, to come out again, and then we reclaim that water and send it back through the reactor again. So that's how we dealt with that problem. So in terms of the, the final separation, we're basically just trying to get rid of that um, uh, CO2, hydrogen, and then the other gases like ethanol there. And so this wound up being a two-stage separator where you um, – First, feed the gas mixture through a compressor here, which basically causes the, the ethanol and other heavier um, fractions to condense. And then that's, that's removed from the gas stream uh, that way, basically by falling to the bottom, uh, dripping, dripping out. And then we pass the remaining uh, mixture through this membrane uh, separation, which is really good at removing um, uh, CO2 and hydrogen, and we wind up with our residue gas. Now, it turns out that we lose a lot of the methane and ethylene if we, don't, if we do this all in a single pass. And so for a little bit of extra mass penalty, you do this in two stages, and then you get pretty much all of it out, and you're only losing it about 10% at that point. Um, the total membrane area in order to provide this at the rate that we're talking is roughly uh, one square meter each. It's all sort of rolled up in a, uh, in a little cylinder. And what I didn't mention is how much we're actually producing, sort of the, the design size here. So I'm going to get to that next. Um, so uh, this is the mass and uh, kind of the, the overall mass picture here. Uh, the total mass of the device is about 400 kilograms, 250, more than 250 that is the radiator panels, and the next heaviest uh, item is the electrochemical stack themselves. Those are heavy steel plates there, and so, you know, in principle, you could maybe redesign it with something lighter, but this is what we had right now. Um, everything else is pretty inconsequential. Uh, in terms of flow rate, what we're producing, this is a pretty high-performance system. Um, with the design that we have, you know, the size that I told you about and roughly 30 kilowatts input, we're able to produce about 15 kilograms per day of methane, uh, slightly less ethylene, and then um, uh, almost 60 uh, kilograms per day of, of oxygen. And now why, the, why did we choose these numbers? Because this is what it takes to be able to completely refill a four-person Mars Ascent vehicle as specified by NASA back in 2009 after 480 days. So it's kind of a, a standard metric that a lot of um, missions have been, uh, 
have been uh, sort of used to compare. And so that winds up with these specs of about seven tons of methane and 26 tons of oxygen. It turns out that because we're making other things besides methane, we actually have a ton of extra oxygen around. And so the stuff that we don't use for the propellant is an additional 32 tons over that time period. And that's basically available for whatever other uses you might need for the oxygen. You don't need it for combustion, but it certainly would be great for, for breathing or for other chemical processes. So that was sort of a nice byproduct. Plus, we get a little bit of hydrogen as well. Um, now, uh, as I said, this is assuming that uh, you're only burning the, the, the methane. If you're actually burning a mixture of methane and ethylene, then you actually need even less oxygen because that's, that's more of the propellant there. Um, all right. So now I'm going to briefly talk about how much time do I have? Roughly 10? Three, six, three, six? Okay. Um, Briefly, so I want to have some time for Q&A, the, the plastic synthesis. So this is based on a very much scaled down version of a commercial, uh, sort of a mini commercial design. These things are really, really big when you're doing this industrially. And so I'm not quite sure that the, uh, uh, that the scaling all worked, but for a first cut engineering pass, I think that this was sufficient here. Essentially what we do is we pass the mixture of ethylene and methane um, through a, uh, uh, through a compressor in order to, to pump up its, its, uh, its pressure, and we pass it through sort of a two-phase reactor. What's interesting here is you have to sort of start by making these little polymer seeds by injecting little tiny pieces of catalyst in there around which the polymer nucleates. But it's important to create these seed particles that are very small so that you can have a uniform distribution. Otherwise, you could have very large pieces of polymer growing in some places, creating so-called hot spots that could uh, create real havoc in your reactor. The other way that you sort of avoid these hot spots is you basically have this circulating really rapidly. And so there's this flow here where you're only allowing contact time of a few seconds per pass, and then it is sort of removed and sort of uh, cycled back in. So I think in my design, it's maybe on the order of 50 passes. And so you can imagine that these particles uh, pick up additional uh, molecular weight uh, each time until it gets to the size that you need it. And periodically, then the entire system, thank you, the entire system uh, purges, and the uh, polymer, which is hopefully still as little liquid droplets or possibly gases, come out. Uh, and then the system is started over again. So um, I don't remember, I think it was like a five minute, um, three minute, r roughly a two and a half minute cycle time here. Um, the solids are separated from the gases through what's called a cyclone, which is. Um, Basically, that uh, it, it forces the, the particles to the outside and, uh, and, and, out of the, uh, and out of the system, so it sort of falls to the bottom. And then um, we do this again at the end in order to get rid of additional gases that might be trapped there and finally produce, um, with 90% recovery, about 9 kilograms per day of this high-density polyethylene product. In addition, as I said, uh, if you're able to remove almost all of the ethylene, you end up with a 97% pure methane product, which was the other design goal of our project. So you kind of get that for free, as I said. Um, the overall system only requires a little bit of additional uh, energy, less than one kilowatt. And in terms of mass, the total um, footprint is less than 20 kilograms. And so this is m far smaller. Now, I will lie, uh, I lied about one thing and to say that there is some additional heat load, which means that you have to increase the size of that radiator panel just a little bit in order to reject the additional heat. But it only adds an additional 20 kilograms to the radiator mass. And so overall, it's roughly 36 kilogram additional mass, but that's really fantastic for being able to get a uh, polyethylene product. Now, I didn't say why polyethylene, what can you use that for? It's, uh, it's very useful as radiation shielding. It can be made into a variety of uh, 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 gas and liquid tight containers. It can be used to make uh, strong structures, furniture and uh, you know, tools and things like that, as well as flexible materials like uh, uh, plastic bags and, uh, and bottles and, and things that humans might need for all kinds of purposes in a remote environment. So um, that's the project and I have time for a few questions if you have any, thank you. In the back, sir. Yes. So, as I said, this is a preliminary design. I have some concern. Sorry. Oh, sorry. The question is, how autonomous can the can this be? Um, for the most part, I think that this can run completely autonomously. 
with one exception, which is in reading about the polymerization, there is a danger of having the walls of that reactor get coated with very high molecular weight uh, solids, basically waxes, that uh, in earth applications are periodically cleaned out by some, you know, maintenance workers who get in there and sort of scrub it out. Can't do that on Mars. So there's going to have to be a lot of design work to figure out how to avoid that buildup entirely through some clever engineering or, I don't know, a robot uh, scrubber. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, I think in the front, for, yeah, you, sir. I have not. Uh, you're thinking that, eth sorry, the, I'll repeat the question. If I wasn't going to make polyethylene, have I considered converting the ethylene chemically into ethane? Um, I haven't. Uh, tell me why ethane would be a better gas than ethylene, possibly. You're thinking for combustion? Hmm. Yeah. I'll repeat this. Right. The gentleman is saying that uh, on the one hand, you've got more uh, hydrogens, but on the other hand, that double bond has a lot of energy. Yeah, so we're kind of getting into the chemical uh, properties. But yeah, I think that ethylene is a pretty efficient fuel because of that double bond. So it releases more energy on combustion compared to its mass if it were singly bonded. But that's something that we would have to look into and see if there's an advantage. I mean, anything with a double bond, just speaking chemically, because I'm a chemist, it's so useful. I would hate to just burn it if that, you know, unless that was really my only choice. I'd much rather turn it into something else useful, if not polyethylene, some other organic molecule for solvents or something else. Um, gentleman in the green. Uh, Jeff, could I address that? Um, uh, sure, Bruce. Um, uh, and uh, then uh, the uh, gentleman uh, in the green. Yeah, yeah, um, Bruce McKenzie, um, years ago, before we knew all about all the ice deposits, Many people assume that we'd have a round trip mission somewhere near the equator and that water would be scarce and hydrogen would be scarce. And um, so, so, so ethane has more carbon and less hydrogen and therefore it's easier on your resources to, for, you know, to launch to orbit. Gotcha. Right. Better source of hydrogen as a result. Yeah. Right. Of course, now we know there's plenty of water, so it may be less of an issue. Yes, sir. Okay, so regolith is basically the uh, the raw rock that is present everywhere on planetary surfaces, you know, um, Mars as, as well. So you can think of it as uh, a mixture of sand, rock, and dust. Um, in order to get the water out of it, since we're assuming that it is either frozen at the surface or sort of in a permafrost, permafrost in the subsurface or possibly chemically bonded with some of the minerals, uh, you have to heat it. You have to crush it and heat it. And that will give you an impure water product, which you then have to pu further purify through filtration and, and possibly some chemical treatment. Um, and do we have time for one more question? Or OK, in the very back, yes. You've been patient. Yes. So the gentleman's asking about the Sabatier process as a competing uh, process for making uh, methane from from water and uh, and co2 uh, absolutely if if all you wanted to do is make pure co2 the Sabatier process is actually really efficient at doing that unlike electrochemical uh, reaction it basically just makes uh, methane and water as, as a result you have to first split the water to make uh, hydrogen and oxygen, and then that reacts with the CO2 to make methane. So uh, that would be that would be the way to go if that's all you wanted to do. But this project was basically seeing what we could do with something that also made a useful plastic. And so in that case, this this is a more flexible de design. All right. If the moderator will allow it, <laughs> quickly. I'll just, 
Yeah, I'll just quickly repeat. He's saying there's interesting work going on about getting water out of regolith, especially on the moon. People are looking at microwaves as well as other approaches, putting a, a dome over it and doing solar passive solar heating. So yeah, we would assume something like that would probably be used here because the conditions are actually pretty s similar. Thank you. <laughs>